Well, hey there, everybody. I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I'm coming to you today from the conference room, which is across from my lab and next to my office. And what I want to talk about today is the problems and advantages of using factorial designs. Because if you watched my previous lesson, you probably believe that factorial designs are like the best thing since sliced bread. And they are, but they do have some problems. Okay, so we'll see factorial designs. Problems. Okay, so here's the thing. Is we've been, or I've been talking about um, this bystander intervention study. Okay. Uh, in terms of two independent variables. So one independent variable is um, gender, which is male or female. And uh, I don't consider gender binary, but for purposes of this study. Second independent variable is context. So that's sick or drunk. However, we don't have to stop at two independent variables. We could have a whole bunch of other independent variables that we add to this. Um, and so actually that's one of the advantages of a factorial design, just to, to bury the lead a little bit. Um, but let's add another independent variable to this study. So the third independent variable could be time of day. So it could be people in the morning. So, you know, someone who's drunk in the morning, that might be kind of uh, uh, an issue. Uh, you know, they need an intervention at that point. Or it could be afternoon. Or it could be at night. And I don't know if you're going to help somebody at night. Um, at least afternoon, the sun's over the yard arm, so you can have a drink in theory. Um, the Dukeham opens at 9 a.m., though, and there's always a line of people waiting to get in. So, uh, if you did this study, this has two levels, so that's a two by two by three study. Uh, as a fourth independent variable, um, we could, uh, what, what could we do? Uh, we could do the age of the person. Now, we can't do like a child, because we can't have a drunk child, but we could have like a college student aged person. We could have middle aged, like me. I'm willing to admit that. I wouldn't say that I'm elderly, though. And so that would be a 2 by 2 by 3 by 3. Uh, and then what else could we do? We could do a fifth independent variable of the way that they're dressed. So they could be kind of sloppy, or they could be um, like in a suit, you know, and maybe you're more likely to help somebody in a suit who's college aged and it's afternoon and they are sick and they're a woman or something like that. But um, by two, so we have a two by two by three by three by two study, five independent variables. Here's the problems. So let's talk about the problems. The first is the more independent variables you have, the more participants you need. So let's stick to what we've been talking about where we have 10 people per group. And let's just say I run this as a two by two study. Uh, two times two is four times 10 is 40. I need 40 people. Uh, if I add this third independent variable, time of day, now I'm up to 120 people that I need. Um, yeah, and so, uh, and it keeps on going up and up and up. I, I don't think you could do 120 because you have like people who constantly need help, let's say you're running this in Kirksville, uh, I think they might start suspecting that something's going on. I think you're gonna run out of participants pretty quickly. The second problem comes with simultaneously manipulating multiple independent variables. So now I need a person, a woman who acts sick in the morning, um, I guess that's morning sickness, or in the afternoon. Uh, I need a middle-aged person at night to act drunk, um, and someone who's in a suit 
um, in the morning to be drunk too. I guess there's a story that goes with, with that also. But it's difficult to simultaneously manipulate uh, multiple independent variables. And so that's another problem. A third problem comes with what we call higher order interactions. And here's a place where your textbook and I disagree. And so I'll say why the textbook is wrong. Um, your, uh, your textbook says that if you have three uh, or more independent variables interacting with each other, that that's a higher order interaction and that can't be interpreted. I was trained that it's four or more independent variables because, and here's the logic behind it. Um, you can think about how three independent variables could interact because you can picture things in three dimensions. If you think about this in terms of like a diorama maybe made in high school or middle school, um, the X and the, the Y are, are easy to, to um, represent. But you can also represent the Z axis too. Like if you hung ping pong balls, you could represent a three dimensional data space. And so you're able to think in terms of three dimensions. Uh, a fourth dimension would be very difficult though, um, because I'm not sure what the fourth dimension is. Um, some people have said it's time. I don't know that it is. So then we have to time travel into it. Uh, so I say it's uh, four independent variables or more interacting with each other can't be interpreted. Um, your book says three. Uh, the book's probably right, but for purposes of my class, I'm right. As a further aside, for my dissertation, I had four independent variables. Two were um, between subjects, between groups, um, and two were within subjects, within groups. And then I had a significant four-way interaction. And one of the people who was on my committee, Bruce Carlson, said, well, how would you interpret that? And I said, well, actually, it can't be interpreted because it's a higher order interaction. And he said, you know what? That's true. And so, uh, yeah. So if you're ever in a similar situation, really any situation, just say it's a, four or it's a higher order interaction and it can't be interpreted. Okay. Well, I don't want to focus on the problems with um, factorial design. So I want to talk about the advantages because there's a number of advantages. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about them at all. One advantage is that they let you test multiple hypotheses. So for example, let's say, um, well, now I'm gonna end up writing everything I just hit up on the board. Um, let's say we, have one, we, we run a study with one independent variable, uh, our bystander intervention study, gender again, uh, male and female. Okay. All we can, if we just run it, I just want to see who gets help more, men or women. That's one main effect. Okay, because we have as many main effects as we have independent variables. So that equals one hypothesis that we can test because uh, all, that's all we've got is the main effect. If we had a second independent variable, like context, uh, so sick or drunk, that's our two by two. Now we have two main effects because we can test the main effect for gender and the main effect for context. And we also have um, one two-way interaction because as we saw in our previous lesson, gender and context interact with each other. And so therefore, that gives us a total of three hypotheses. Two main effects, one two-way interaction. So now we've tripled the number of hypotheses that we can test. Let's add our third independent variable, which I can't remember what it was, um, but it's gonna have three levels because I already wrote a three there. Uh, let's do time of day. And so we'll do morning, uh, afternoon, and nighttime. I can't spell evening, so I'll write night. Uh, if we had this study, a two by two by three study, um, we're gonna have as many main effects as we have independent variables. So if we have three, main, three independent variables, we have three main effects. Plus, 
we're going to have multiple two-way interactions because gender is going to interact with context, context is going to interact with time of day, and gender interacts with time of day. So we have three two-way interactions and one three-way interaction, which is all three of these interacting with each other. And so that gives us seven hypotheses that we can test. Three main effects, three two-way interactions, one three-way interaction. So it's a much more efficient way of doing research. So that's uh, one of the advantages. I guess I didn't put advantages, which I can't spell either because this board does not have a spell checker. Uh, but that's the first advantage, is that we can test multiple hypotheses. The second advantage is that if we have a confounding variable, which means some outside variable which might have an impact on our study, like time of day or the way the person's dressed, we can just add it. Keeping in mind that if we have a significant four-way interaction, we're not going to be able to interpret it. But uh, this can be very good because, um, yeah, because there's things that we're missing uh, that we're not paying attention to. And so uh, if someone points out, hey, why didn't you look at uh, the age of the person who needed help? You can say, oh, I didn't think of that. And then you can just add that to your study too. The third advantage uh, goes back to what we were really originally talking about, which is that factorial designs test interactions. Because uh, you're always having multiple independent variables, which generates interactions. And we think that interactions are much more like real life than um, one independent variable designs. Now, uh, when you have one independent variable like someone pointing a gun at you, then you're very limited in what you can do. But life isn't usually that. In the same way, life isn't usually one um, independent variable. It's a number of different things interacting with each other. So like, uh, like we talked about what you're going to do on any particular weekend, how much homework you've got, uh, what your friends are doing, how much money, uh, what the weather's like, etc. So I want to leave you with this idea that the advantages far outweigh um, the problems with factorial designs, which is why we continue to use them. That's what I want to talk about for this lesson. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are, and take care.